you know, sometimes I'll see people add, say, for a fixed pitch prop, they they might be adding, you know, 300 RPM. And that is often way too much. If you've just settled slightly below, sometimes it's just 50 RPM is all you need to gently get back up to that, you know, final, that stabilized final approach. That's Catherine Cavagnaro talking about landings. And today, she answers the question as to whether you should control your airspeed on final using pitch or power. Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. Last week in episode 223, we talked with Kelly Krajewski about new laser eye protection for pilots, and with Rob Mark about the scope of the aircraft laser strikes problem. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com 223. This week, after the news, we'll talk with Catherine Cavagnaro about the front and back sides of the power curve and how that relates to controlling your landing speed. Later, we'll also have some of your emails and comments. Thanks so much for sending those. I love sharing those on the show. And this is a listener-supported show, and we're still ad-free. So please join us now. Sign up and become a member and support the show financially at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And when you do, I'll read your name on the show. This week in the news, airline pilots are holding protests and will tell you why. A jet charter company in Southern California is ordered to pay a whistleblower nearly a million dollars. And finally, we have a story of a pilot with a dog ate my homework type of excuse for why he crashed on landing. All this and more, and the news starts now. From KETV.com, which is a TV station in Nebraska, jet fuel prices are soaring. Inflation hit a 40-year high last week and gas prices are climbing. According to the AAA, the national average for a gallon of regular is 431, the highest on record. The pain goes beyond gas pumps. Jet fuel is also soaring, so you may pay the price there as well. Oracle Aviation, which is an FBO at the Omaha airport, hopes the number of flyers doesn't take a nosedive. Dave Poole, VP of Business Development, said, It's a major issue right now that we're watching very closely. Poole said the cost has gone up roughly 75% in the last year. Jet fuel now costs about $6 a gallon. Quote, It's the most significant price increase we've seen in the eight years that we've been out here at the airport, and pretty much in the 20-plus years that I've been in the industry. Poole said a plane burns about 60 gallons of jet fuel an hour, times $6 for the price per gallon, and it's about $360 for one hour in the air. As for the large passenger jets, Poole says these take about 3,000 gallons, and that cost is likely to be passed on to you. It impacts our flight training students and the costs related to their training, but it also impacts, you know, the general passenger carrying aircraft, all of your cargo operations, charter flights, life flights. Anything related to aviation, the cost to operate has gone up significantly, he said. With prices this high, he says people will likely fly less or not at all, which they've already seen in the last two weeks. We're seeing renters renting less, people taking fewer trips, people consolidating flights, and trying to do multiple stops in one trip to save going back out a second time, he said. As for how long these prices will keep going up, Poole says that's up in the air. From flyer.co.uk, that's Flyer Magazine, Europe moves to ban lead in avgas. Moves to ban lead in aviation gasoline are not just in the U.S. Europe is also on the brink of banning tetraethylead, TEL, the chemical which adds the lead in 100 low lead fuel. Europe Air Sports, which represents sport and recreational aviation in Europe, recently warned of the upcoming ban. It reports that the European Chemical Agency wants to transfer TEL as a toxic substance to the REACH, or Registration, Evaluation, Authorization, and Restriction of Chemicals Register. ECHA lists TEL on its list of substances of high concern. Apparently, no decisions are officially published yet to place TEL on the REACH register, said Europe Air Sports. We know from reliable sources that all member states voted for this process. It can be expected that the official regulation might be published in March 2022. The consequences have to be assessed and communicated afterwards. Avgas 100 low lead itself is not yet banned. From FlyingMag.com, Joby Aviation Air Taxi prototype was substantially damaged in crash. Last month's test flight accident of a Joby Aviation eVTOL air taxi prototype occurred after experienced a component failure, resulting in substantial damage to the aircraft, according to a prelim report released by the NTSB last week. 
A report says that no one was killed or injured in the February 16th accident, which occurred while the aircraft was being piloted by remote control in a rural area of California. At the time of the crash, the eVTOL was flying at 272 miles per hour, well above its design cruise speed of 200 miles per hour, according to the ADSB aircraft tracking app. The aircraft, November 542 Alpha Juliet, was one of two similar Joby eVTOL test articles propelled by six tilt rotors powered by lithium-ion batteries. The aircraft had been undergoing an accelerated flight test campaign to expand its envelope for speed, range, altitude, and other parameters. In the weeks prior to the accident, Joey had announced it had reached a record test flight speed of 205 miles per hour and a record altitude of 11,000 feet. The aircraft is designed to cruise at 200 miles per hour, according to Joby's website. Joby is among the leaders of a new eVTOL industry, spending hundreds of millions of dollars to build environmentally friendly, battery-powered air taxis. The company has flown more than 1,000 test flights since it began flying full-size prototypes in 2017. In an SEC filing posted the day after the accident, Joby said, quote, experimental flight test programs are intentionally designed to determine the limits of aircraft performance, and accidents are unfortunately a possibility. Joby also said for safety reasons, the tests were taking place outside expected operating conditions with a remote pilot in an uninhabited area. And we have two stories related to the pilot shortage. This first one comes from thepointsguy.com. SkyWest battles pilot shortage by shifting dozens of non-stop flights into one-stops. Take SkyWest service to Fort Dodge, Iowa, for example. That route is currently served as a non-stop round trip from United's hub of O'Hare Airport, but starting next month it will morph into a multi-stop service that also incorporates SkyWest route to Mason City. One daily round trip, UA5015, will see one of SkyWest's 50-seat Canada Air Regional Jet 200s fly from Chicago to Fort Dodge, then to Mason City, then back to Chicago. Another round trip in the opposite direction from Chicago to Mason City, and then to Fort Dodge, then back to Chicago. A spokesperson for SkyWest told TPG that, quote, we've modified some schedules to maximize the service we're able to continue to provide with our current staffing resources. In the case of SkyWest, the Department of Transportation might want to take a look at the change, said industry analyst Henry Hardevelt, president of Atmosphere Research. Quote, for travelers who live in the affected cities or are visiting the cities whose service is being changed, it will be important to understand whether they continue to have the same easy access to United's network and schedules at its various hubs, Hardevelt told TPG in an interview. This move by SkyWest is just the latest inconvenience that travelers and small communities are facing due to the pilot shortage. Regional routes, particularly those belonging to United, have been cut extensively in the past six months as regional airlines struggle to replace pilots who are leaving in large numbers to work for the major airlines. And from WSBTV.com, which is a TV station, Delta pilots protest, saying a record number of overtime hours is wearing them out. Delta Airlines pilots hit the picket lines in Atlanta last week, lining up outside of the Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport. They were protesting their work schedules and said they are being overworked, though they are not calling the protest a strike. Channel 2's Burnt Peterson was at the airport where pilots said there are not enough of them to handle the growing number of flights. They said they're working a record amount of overtime and it's wearing them out. Captain Evan Bach with the Airline Pilots Association said, Our pilots are tired. They are frustrated with their schedules. 200 union pilots arrived in waves with a list of grievances on the signs they carried. One read, if I look tired, it's because I am. The union said there are just not enough pilots to cover the growing number of flights as the airline returns to a pre-pandemic schedule. Janice Huff said it was unnerving to hear about pilots' long hours when she was about to board. I don't want a tired pilot flying my plane, she said. That's concerning. Delta released a statement saying all of its pilot schedules exceed safety requirements set by the FAA, as well as those outlined in the pilot's contracts. The two sides are currently negotiating a new deal. Box said pilots are concerned that there are not enough pilots in case of bad weather or an operation issue. The company is scheduling more flights than they have pilots to fly them, Box said. We're concerned there's not enough buffer there. Union pilots plan to pick it again on March 25th at the Los Angeles International Airport. From whistleblowersblog.org, OSHA orders private aviation company to pay fired whistleblower $958,000. On March 2nd, the U.S. DOT, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, announced that it ordered a private aviation company to pay an employee back wages and associated cost 
after the employee was retaliated against for reporting safety concerns. According to the news release, an OSHA investigation found that California-based Pegasus Elite Aviation retaliated against an employee who, quote, reported safety issues that led to an on-site inspection. After the whistleblower raised safety concerns, Pegasus Elite Aviation sent a falsified and negative pilot records Improvement Act report to the worker's new employer, violating the whistleblower provision. The falsified report then caused the employee to be fired. Additionally, OSHA found that the aviation company, quote, provided falsified information to the FAA that contributed to the agency's decision to suspend the former employee's pilot certificates. As a result of the investigation, Pegasus Elite Aviation will pay more than $898,000 in back wages and associated cost, $50,000 in emotional damages, and $10,000 in attorney fees as ordered by OSHA. The company will also have to send a letter of correction to the FAA and other employers who received the falsified report, removing the derogatory information. The U.S. Department of Labor will enforce the protections afforded to airline workers who do what's right and raise their safety concerns, said OSHA Regional Administrator James Wolfe in the news release. No matter the industry, every worker has the right to report safety concerns of any kind without fearing retaliation. And from avweb.com, an article by Jeb Burnside called Accident Probe, How High Will It Go? On October 13th, 2018, at 1058 Eastern Time, a Piper Seneca II was destroyed when it impacted the Atlantic Ocean near West Hampton Beach, New York. The CFI, a private pilot, and the passenger were fatally injured. Visual conditions prevailed at the surface with instrument conditions at altitude. The flight departed Danbury, Connecticut around 1025 and requested VFR flight following to Charleston, South Carolina, with an on-course heading of 219 degrees at 8,500 feet MSL. At 1037, the flight was at 9,200 feet, tracking in a southeasterly direction. By 1045, it had continued to 15,000 feet and continued on its heading. The CFI told ATC that they were in and out of instrument conditions and trying to maintain VMC, and they had an unreliable attitude indicator. At 1046, the controller declared an emergency on behalf of the pilot and attempted to locate VFR conditions. At 1048, the controller advised the instructor to start a left turn to 300 degrees to reach VFR conditions. The CFI confirmed the heading. However, radar data indicated that the airplane's ground track continued southeast. The plane was now at 15,500 feet. By 1049, the airplane appeared to be in a slow right turn and the controller suggested leveling the wings with a turn coordinator. The airplane was climbing through 17,000 feet. A series of exchanges ensued with the flight requesting a vector, ATC giving it, and the flight failing to turn to the given heading. At 10.55, with the airplane at 19,400 feet, the CFI indicated they were starting to turn to the west, but radar showed the airplane beginning a series of figure eight turns. At 10.56, the airplane entered an abrupt descending turn, The controller twice recommended leveling the wings, and the CFI twice responded that they were in a descent. There were no further transmissions from the airplane. Radar contact was lost shortly thereafter at about 10.58. One witness saw the airplane nosedive from out of the clouds and into the ocean after hearing the engines throttle up severely and wind back down several times. Another witness heard a pop and saw pieces of metal descending from the sky. In 2011, the CFI's pilot certificate was revoked for falsifying logbook entries, and his mechanic certificate was suspended for operating an airplane in an unairworthy condition. An employee at the CFI's flight training business did not believe he was instrument current at the time of the accident. Another flight instructor stated that one of the accident airplane's vacuum pumps was not working a few weeks earlier, and that it was necessary to reset the directional gyroscope every 10 minutes by flying straight and level and resetting it to match the magnetic compass. Satellite imagery depicted an extensive area of clouds obscuring the accident site, consistent with Nimbostratus clouds that supported light to moderate rain. Pilot reports in the area indicated cloud tops to 23,000 feet, with no mention of multiple layers. The CFI did not file a flight plan, and there was no record of him having obtained a weather briefing. The NTSB determined the probable cause of this accident to include the instructor's decision to conduct and continue a VFR flight into instrument conditions, with a known flight instrument anomaly, which resulted in spatial disorientation, causing a loss of airplane control and subsequent in-flight breakup. Contributing to the accident were the instructor's lack of recent instrument flight experience and degraded airplane control and decision-making due to hypoxia. And later in the article, Jeb says, 
from 12,000 to 15,000 feet of altitude, judgment, memory, alertness, coordination, and ability to make calculations are impaired, and headache, drowsiness, dizziness, and either a sense of well-being, euphoria, or belligerence occur. The effects appear following increasingly shorter periods of exposure to increasing altitude. In fact, pilot performance can seriously deteriorate within 15 minutes at 15,000 feet. From avweb.com, Australia recommends helmets for some pilots. Australia's Air Transportation Safety Board has issued a safety advisory notice recommending that pilots who do low-level work wear an approved helmet to improve their chances of survivability in the low-energy crashes that claim pilots doing this work every year. Quote, a correctly fitted and secured flight helmet can significantly reduce injuries and save lives in the event of a serious incident or accident, but to be fully effective, it must be adjusted to fit the head, and the chin strap must be fastened securely, ATSB Chief Commissioner Angus Mitchell said in a news release. In addition, helmets must be serviced regularly, routinely inspected for damage, and replaced immediately if it has sustained a major impact. The recommendation came as part of the final report into an accident involving an aerial spray helicopter that was less than 20 feet above the ground when it caught a skid on a power line and went out of control. The ATSB said the pilot was wearing a helmet, but that particular helmet didn't help much. Although the pilot was wearing a flight helmet, it came off after initial impact and did not attenuate the impact forces to a survivable level, the report said. The pilot also slipped out of the shoulder restraint, and the report said a four- or five-point restraint would have been better. From AOPA.org, student handles throttle trouble on final. College student and student pilot Akash Agrawal was flying solo and on final approach to Watsonville Airport, which is very close by here in California, in January when an attempted power reduction sent the engine revving to full power and further throttle adjustments had no effect. Quote, when I was about five miles out, when I pulled my throttle, the RPM went over 2,800 RPM, which is the max. That's when I realized something was wrong. Agarol boarded his landing and began circling nearby to troubleshoot the throttle. Realizing he had completely lost throttle authority, Agarol contacted 121.5 and declared an emergency. There was no response from ATC as radio coverage in the area can be spotty, but two pilots from FedEx and Alaska Airlines quickly offered Agarol a few suggestions. After a few more minutes of circling and still unable to reach ATC, Agarol switched over to the Watsonville CTAF for help. Live ATC recorded Agarol's initial request. Watsonville traffic, November 49931, still about four miles out of runway 20. I think I'll have to cut the engine when I'm going in for landing because right now I have no throttle control. I cannot land with 100% power. Within seconds, the CFI came on the frequency to offer assistance. ATC was eventually able to contact Agarwal via other aircraft in the area to see if he would like to receive emergency equipment, which Agarwal declined at the time. In hindsight, he said, I should not have been scared to get equipment. That was one thing I should have done. After a few minutes of speaking with the CFI, it was decided that he would use the mixture to control engine power and descend into Watsonville. According to Agarwal, he attempted to restart the engine at about 800 feet on final, but was unable to do so. Ultimately, he landed the aircraft safely and cleared the runway. Agarwal recalled calling his mother, who lives in India, to share what had happened. It was 6 a.m. in India when he made that first call, and her response, according to him, was, So you landed right? Okay, we're going back to bed now. His parents called back hours later, and they wanted to know every single thing that happened. They didn't realize it at first when it happened, but after, I think they freaked out a little bit, which is funny, he said. Recalling the incident, he said he's learned to stay calm and be a lot more organized in the cockpit. He said, I could have been a little more calm. I did sound pretty calm, but there was still a lot of panic inside of me. I lost my checklist at the worst possible time, which got stuck under my iPad. Something I want to do is have my cockpit a little more organized. Agarwal has his check ride scheduled in April, and we wish him well. From AirfaxJournal.com, kids in the cockpit, be sterile and not hurt. As a talkative toddler who grew up in an aviation family, the author says, I became very familiar with the term sterile cockpit. Sterile cockpit was a kind way for my father to tell me to shut up. As I got older, I understood its importance because my dad was a single pilot operator and had a lot to focus on. We even started using the term outside the cockpit when somebody was busy with another important task like being on the phone or doing homework. Quote, I need a sterile cockpit for five minutes but he remembers a time when the exact opposite situation got us in trouble. When I was 12, my father and I took our Cessna 182 to Cincinnati for a Reds game. 
The next day, as we prepared to leave Lincoln Airport, an unfamiliar airport to my father, I sat in the right seat as the ground controller gave us one of those taxi instructions, which seemed to contain every letter in the English alphabet and a few letters in other languages. I caught most of it and remained quiet as my father asked for progressives. The ground controller was frustratingly busy and half-heartedly agreed. The one part of the instruction I did make out clearly was hold short at alpha. I watched my father sweat in the hot Ohio sun, trying to go through every pre-flight checklist and diagram that Garmin had in the PFD. I kept quiet because I knew from years of flying with him that when Dad gets tasks saturated, he needs a sterile cockpit. In his fight to make the Garmin work, I saw us slowly approach the yellow and black hold short line. He knows, I thought to myself, not feeling the need to fill Dad's head with unnecessary conversation, but it became apparent he wasn't going to stop. I began to have an internal conversation. Maybe I heard the instruction wrong. This is Alpha, right? But I kept quiet. Sterile cockpit. He knows what he is doing. I'm a passenger. Then it came. Cessna and Alpha, hold short. That's where I told you to stop. Were you not listening? I don't remember what followed, but I do remember it wasn't the warmest conversation. After getting put at the end of the taxi order, we finally made it out of Cincinnati. Thankfully, no phone number to call. Dad learned a hard lesson about task management, but I learned something too. It was time to ask to take a more active role in the cockpit. Sterile cockpit was certainly important, but maybe it shouldn't mean no talking whatsoever. I was of the age and flight experience where I knew what was going on and shouldn't have just sat there like a deer. If I had put a voice behind any of those internal concerns, it could have really helped my father. It was time to be slightly more than a mere passenger. Afterwards, I began asking Dad for more minor responsibilities. That lesson learned on Taxiway Alpha at Lunkin Airport is one that I haven't forgotten as I have become a pilot. It's okay to involve your right seater up to a point. In my pre-flight conversations, I try to explain that as a passenger, you aren't just a passive observer. A sterile cockpit is important, but if I'm about to hit a deer or a bird that I don't see, you need to speak up. I try and give them minor tasks such as looking for traffic and pointing it out to me when entering busy airspace or holding a checklist. It's not just practically good cockpit management, but you never know what could spark an interest in aviation. And finally from the BBC.com, plane crashed on turbulence from wind farm. A pilot injured in a crash landing has claimed a violent gust that caused him to lose control of his plane may have been caused by a nearby wind farm. The 66-year-old man crashed off the runway and into a field while attempting to land at Beverly Airfield in England. According to the Air Accident Investigation Branch, or AAIB, he said he believed turbulence effects from the wind farm may have contributed to the loss of control. The report concluded that while the possibility of encountering wake turbulence from the wind farm at this airfield is remote, it cannot be entirely ruled out. The AAIB said the private pilot had reported strong turbulence as he approached 150 feet and had taken action to keep the wings level. As he neared the ground, he encountered a further violent gust, and despite his efforts to pull up the 1959 Piper PA-22-150 plane, he veered to the left and came down in a field. The pilot told crash investigators he believed wake turbulence from the spinning blades was a contributing factor. The nearest wind turbine to the runway was 1,400 meters away, according to the report, and I've run the calculation. That's almost a mile. It's 0.86 statute miles. The pilot, who had just 119 hours of flying experience, suffered minor injuries while the plane was destroyed. The final report said current research suggests the nearest turbine was far enough away from the runway at Beverly not to impact on planes, but that the possibility could not be ruled out. Well, I think we can rule it out. I run the calculations, and if the wind was blowing at 25 miles an hour, it would take a full two minutes for the turbulence from a wind turbine to blow 0.86 miles to reach the airport. And while wake turbulence way up in the sky doesn't dissipate for three to four minutes, I think the interference and friction from the ground would break up turbulence within two minutes. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, Catherine Cavagnaro talks about the region of reverse command, that is the backside of the power curve, and whether you should be using pitch or power to control your airspeed on final. And then more of your feedback and questions, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let me tell you a little bit about Catherine. She's an expert on spins, aerobatics, and upset recovery, and owns a flight school called Ace Aerobatics School, located at the Sewanee Franklin County Airport in Tennessee on the campus of the University of the South. In addition to holding ATP and CFI certificates, she also has a PhD in mathematics. 
She is a professor of mathematics at the University of the South and is chair of the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science. Catherine is the 2020 National CFI of the Year, and she also serves as a designated pilot examiner. Now here's our conversation with Catherine Cavagnaro. Catherine, great to see you again. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Max. Great to see you. It's it's like this is a tradition. <laughs> well, let's continue to make it one. <laughs> Sounds good. Hey, you had an article in the uh, March issue of uh, AOPA magazine, and I want to get to that a little bit later. But first, tell us a little about airspeed control on final. As an examiner, what kinds of things are you seeing when you give practical exams? Airspeed in the pattern in general can be a real weakness in practical exams that I give. And if people are going to err on one side or the other, they're they typically come in a little too fast, surprisingly. As, as much as people are afraid of stalling an airplane, usually they, they come in too fast and, and that's their big error. So, you know, from my home airport, which is has a narrow runway and a short runway, and sometimes we've got gusty conditions, you know, if adding five knots to the airspeed, to the approach speed, sounds like a good idea. Well, then, you know, 10 knots must be a, a much better idea. So they come in too fast and then they end up having the tendency to maybe porpoise or land very long. And our runway doesn't, you know, support long landings. So uh, anyway, there can be lots of different ways that Coming in with too much airspeed, you know, rears its head on a practical exam. Yeah, airspeed is good. Too much is not so good. Now, you've talked about them being fast. How are they in their ability to nail a particular airspeed and stay on that particular airspeed? Well, some candidates uh, seem to be lacking in this. And in the debrief, we'll often talk about that. And, um, you know, I ask them why they're coming in with uh, so much airspeed. And on some of those debriefs, we end up talking about whether the, the age old weather pitch uh, controls your airspeed or is it power? And um, some of them have it backward and that can be the source of the problem. And then others seem to know it maybe at a rote level, but they really don't understand why it's important to control your airspeed using your pitch control and your altitude with your power control, especially in the pattern. Yeah. And just to be clear, this applies when you're at what we would call pattern type speeds, right? If we're in cruise, kind of a different relationship. Right. And we'll talk about that. But, you know, candidates should know that we examiners are looking for at least application level of knowledge. Uh, if you're stuck back at the rote and you can't apply it, it really doesn't matter that you memorized it at the rote level to begin with. We need to see that you can apply that information. Sure. I've had that kind of discussion with people where we'll talk about, yes, use pitch to control airspeed on final. And what do I see them doing? They're using the throttle <laughs> They're right. all over the map usually as a result. Let's talk a little bit about the relationship between airspeed and changing power. Right. Yeah. So first of all, I want to back up and say that all of this uh, started with a letter that I received from an AOPA reader. Uh, I write the Flying Smart column for Pilot Magazine, and Joel Newman wrote me and explained a discussion that he had had among some flight instructors. And he, Joel had mentioned that in the pattern, and especially on final, He's using pitch to control airspeed and power to control altitude. And not all of the CFIs agreed. Uh, they didn't think that you were there yet at the place where, you know, pitch controls airspeed and power controls altitude. And so Joel's question for me is, well, where is there? And uh, I thought that was a great topic. And that's why it became the topic for my column in March 2022. AOPA Pilot Magazine. So in that article, I dove in to explain the whys. So at least pilots will maybe understand, they'll reach an understanding level, so they'll be more likely to be able to apply it. And that's why I'm here talking with you today, Max, to, uh, to help your listeners do the same. So let's dive in and talk about velocity and your airspeed and your ability to climb. 
First of all, for a fixed power setting, let's just say that we have an airplane that is flying with full power. We'll make it easy. So the power stays uh, fixed at the full setting. Maybe the airplane is, is losing altitude. You've got a very low pitch attitude. You have a low angle of attack as well. So you have a high airspeed, a low angle of attack. So let's start there with lots of altitudes. So this is a safe exercise. And if you think about as you pull back on the yoke, what's going to happen? Your angle of attack is going to increase. Your airspeed is going to decrease. And maybe you'll stop descending. You're going to start maybe keeping a level altitude. If you pull back even more, your vertical speed is going to go up again. So if you keep pulling back, again, your airspeed um, is going to go down and your vertical speed goes up. And then when you get, you'll get to a certain point where you'll reach the maximum vertical speed that your airplane can sustain. And if you keep pulling back, what's going to happen is your vertical speed is going to start to decrease again, all the way down to a stall. And probably at the stall, you're, you're probably losing altitude uh, at that point. So if you think about graphing that vertical speed against airspeed, it becomes like an upside down U-shape curve where on the right-hand side, you're looking at higher airspeeds and a low climb rate. Uh, there's a special place in the middle where your climb rate is the highest, and that's our VY airspeed. So that's the airspeed that's published in the POH. And if, again, if you keep pulling back, your airspeed is, uh, your, excuse me, your vertical speed is going to um, decrease along with your airspeed. So the front side of the power curve is defined as those airspeeds that are greater than your VY airspeed. And the back side of the power curve are the airspeeds that fall below uh, your best rate of climb VY airspeed. So what differentiates the front of the power curve from the back, just to review, is that on the front side of the power curve, when you pull back on the yoke, your vertical speed increases. On the back side of the power curve, when you pull back on the yoke, your vertical speed actually decreases. So that back side of the power curve is also called the region of reverse command. And I'm sure you've, you've heard of that. In fact, you probably tell your students that all the time. Well, usually I'm telling them other things, but that does come up occasionally. <laughs> now let's just looking at your, your graph here. So we've got airspeed on the X axis. Uh, so as we have low airspeed on the left, we have high airspeed on the far right. And then on the vertical axis, we've got the rate of climb or vertical speed, so at the top of the graph, it's going to be the highest vertical speed we'd have. And that's kind of the, the top of the U, which is where VY is. Uh, and so to the right side of the graph is the front side of the power curve where we're fast. Uh, to the left side of the curve is the back side of the power curve when we're slow and we're pitched up at high angles of attack. Right. And in a lot of our flying, you know, we spend a lot of time around cruise flight. And when we pull back on the yoke, are like we say, the vertical speed will uh, increase. So if you want to go up, you can pull back. And again, as we said, on the back side of the power curve, it's the opposite. So it's interesting to note that Wolfgang Langevisha, in his famous book, Stick and Rudder, uh, used that to show you that really the elevator doesn't elevate. In fact, he insisted on calling that surface the flippers. He didn't want to call it an elevator because he felt like that was a, a misnomer. So another thing that we can do is instead of keeping that power fixed, if we choose a different power setting and fix it, then we can get a similar upside down U-shaped curve. And the top of that will correspond to VY for that power setting. The, the VY that's in our POH is typically for full power or whatever a climb power setting would be. So um, we can look at a sequence of those U-shaped curves 
And when our power setting is reduced, we just get a lower U-shaped power curve on that same axis that, that you were describing, Max. And if you think about that, now look at that range of power curves. If you now hold your airspeed constant, here's the key. If you increase your power, if you choose a higher manifold pressure or a higher power setting, then what will happen is you will always uh, have a higher climb rate. That is something that is true no matter where you are on the power curve. So if you're at a fast airspeed and you want to move up, increase your power. If you're on the, at a very low airspeed and you want to move up, increase your power. So that's the, the predictable part of the power controlling altitude. No matter what airspeed you're at, power can control altitude. So how would you correct for altitude deviations? One way to answer that is, well, using power. And it, like I said before, it always works the same way. If you are too low, add power. If you're too high, reduce the power. Uh, and you'll either rise to or settle back down to your cruise altitude. You could also use the flippers uh, t- instead of a power change to correct that. In other words, you could use the elevator to do that. Now, on the front side of the power curve, that's easy, right? So again, if a gust pushes you upward, then you just push forward on the yoke and you'll settle back down to your cruise altitude. If a gust pushes you down, you'll just pull back on the yoke and you'll rise back to your cruise altitude. And this is exactly the way an autopilot corrects for any of the aircraft altitude deviations. It just does it very quickly. Honestly, the the autopilot notices altitude deviations a little quicker than I do. So uh, it's a little better than uh, I am at it. But all right, let's move to the backside of the power curve. Suppose that you were determined to make those changes using the elevator. Uh, If a gust pushes you up, you know, if you think about it, you want to settle back down. So what would you do? You'd, you'd want to actually pull back on the yoke to settle back down to your cruise altitude or your desired altitude, because it's in pulling back that you'll have a um, lower vertical speed. The trouble with this is if you're already at a lower airspeed, Max, can you imagine what would happen if you pull back on the yoke even more? You could induce a stall, right? And it will definitely go down then. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, another way to do it would be if you think about that power curve, the the vertical speed versus um, uh, airspeed curve, you could push so far forward right? You know, you could put the nose way down, uh, pitch way down, but neither of those is an optimal technique. And we are looking for a technique that's going to make our passengers want to fly with us again. And unfortunately, neither of those, those would work. The trouble is the right way to go in this case on the backside of the power curve, like we say, doesn't inspire confidence. And honestly, it's pretty confusing because we spend most of our time pulling back to make the airplane go up. And that that backside of the power curve, when things are backward, that's, that's and especially when we tend to be lower, uh, if we're in the pattern, you know, we're maybe a thousand feet up, maybe even lower, maybe we're 400 feet above the ground. We don't want to be confused that way. And I've had this discussion with people who will then try and prove to me that, oh yes, I can definitely control my airspeed using the power. And they can, but it's definitely not going to be controlled as well. Right. Talk about why it's important to actually use pitch for controlling our airspeed on final. What makes it super important to do it that way is that another feature of being on the backside of the power curve is that you actually have airspeed instability. So let's talk about being on the backside of the power curve. And if you've seen one of those graphs that has power available versus power required to sustain flight at a particular airspeed, on the backside of the power curve, 
If you suddenly have, suppose you're in level flight and you suddenly have a decrease in airspeed, in order to sustain that newer decreased airspeed, you actually need more power. But if you're not putting it in, what's going to happen is the airspeed is going to continue to decrease. So that's airspeed instability. And it works the other way. If you have a momentary increase in airspeed on the backside of the power curve, since the power required to sustain that flight is less, then you actually have the tendency to increase all the way past VY. Okay, so instability, we like airplanes to be stable, right? They're easier to fly. So if you are going to try to uh, maintain um, flight on the backside of the power curve, just know that you have airspeed instability. So if you are trying to uh, maintain it using power, that's gonna not going to be nearly as precise and you're going to have greater airspeed deviations. Uh, So instability, a system that's unstable is like standing on a basketball. It can be done, but uh, I'm probably not that good to to do that in the pattern. So, uh, and we don't want our pilots trying to stand on basketballs uh, while they're trying to land the airplane. So yeah, and they certainly don't want to stand on the basketball in the airplane as they're trying to fly because that's going to be doubly difficult. Right. Another argument, which, which I think is you know pretty compelling, is that when we're coming into land and we're on the backside of the power curve and we're slow to control airspeed, if we do it with pitch, we have we're controlling just a single variable, which makes it very easy. If you're trying to control it with power, you're going to have to compensate with changes in pitch simultaneously, which means you're really making it a heck of a lot harder to try and make small, precise changes in airspeed. That's absolutely right. And I think at this point, it makes sense to talk about, say, a flight and how we are controlling our um, climb rate and, and our altitude throughout the flight. So just as an example, let's think about me flying my Bonanza. Okay, so I take off with full power in my Bonanza, so full manifold pressure and full forward um, on the RPM. And I'll initially, if there are obstacles around, I might initially pick up VX. So the only thing I'm controlling uh, is the airspeed using my pitch control. And I might initially hit VX until I'm uh, assured that I cleared the obstacles. And then I'll pick up VY airspeed that gives me my best rate away from the ground. And I'll do that until I have sufficient options. If I were to have any sort of like an engine failure or, or some, some sort of comprom- compromise with uh, the engine. And after that, I'll pick up a cruise climb airspeed so that I have better forward visibility and also more better cooling to to care for my engine. So I'll maintain that cruise climb airspeed until I get to my desired altitude. And so what do I do there? I will go ahead and push forward on the yoke and I'll maintain a constant altitude. I'll reduce my manifold pressure and uh, propeller setting. I usually go for 23 squared, just a personal preference. And depending on atmospheric conditions or my altitude, basically, I accept the airspeed that I get. So I don't know exactly what airspeed I'm going to get. But once uh, everything stabilizes, I accept the airspeed that I get. Maybe it's 153 knots indicated. If I want to go faster, then what I'll do is I will choose a higher power setting I again let my pitch maintain my pitch control, my yoke maintain a constant altitude. And then once again, I accept the airspeed that I get. So the point there is that even on the front side of the power curve, setting speed with power is not an exacting process, right? It's that set it, wait, set it again, wait. And, and accept the airspeed that you ultimately get. 
So, and I think that's, that's echoing what you were saying is, uh, happens in the pattern as well. That's not an exacting process, uh, in, in order to set airspeed using power. Now on descent toward the pattern, what I'll do is I typically reduce my power a bit, push the nose forward to maintain the, exactly the airspeed that I want. If the conditions are smooth, I tend to hit VNO and keep it there. So that VNO is the dividing line between the green arc and the yellow arc. And if the, if the air, if I'm going through layers that are particularly gusty, I'll bring the airplane, I'll bring the airspeed back to maneuvering speed so that I don't sustain any damage. Uh, and that's something about which that kind of control, you don't want to be sloppy with, right? So if I'm in gusty conditions, I want to make sure that I hit VA, my maneuvering speed, and no more than that. So even in the descent toward the airport, I'm actually controlling my airspeed using my pitch control because it's much more exacting to do it that way. And let me just throw out one thought about that. Uh, certainly, if you find that you are a little fast and you start hitting turbulence, besides pulling back the power, one of the fastest ways to slow up quickly to VA or VO, depending on the airplane, is just to pitch up. And so I think sometimes people don't realize just because you're in a descent doesn't mean you can't pitch up as needed to slow the aircraft so that you're not getting thrown all over the airplane. Absolutely. So that is how I am controlling uh, my desired airspeed. I'm doing it with pitch. So even when I'm descending from my cruise altitude, nowhere near the pattern, I'm using my pitch control, uh, as you say, to more precisely maintain that desired airspeed. In the pattern, I'm usually about 100 knots on the downwind. I put down my gear, extend some flaps, and then I usually carry about 80 knots around until final, short final, and then I'm slowing up to 70, and then I'm bringing it in for the flare. So what's interesting, backing up to Joel's question about when are we there, I know your mileage may vary, right? So people do things different ways. But for me, I'm there anytime I'm not in cruise flight. So anytime I'm not in cruise flight, I'm letting my airspeed be controlled by pitch. And I'm using power to control either my altitude or my, you know, ascent or descent profile. Yeah, I totally agree. I tell folks that when we're on final Make small changes in pitch for airspeed and then use whatever power it takes to get to the runway. So if you're coming up a little bit short, hey, add some power. If you're looking high on the glide slope, then pull the power back. And that really makes it very simple to, to control uh, your airspeed that way. Now let's talk a little bit about power settings and what kind of sensitivity you know people should be using when they're setting power on final. Right. Yeah. You were just mentioning that you tell your students appropriately that they should be managing their altitude profile using power. And those power adjustments are often just very small. The necessary power adjustments. In fact, if you are, say you're on final and it looks like you are um, descending below your aiming point. So um, you want to add a bit more power, you know, sometimes I'll see people add, say for a fixed pitch prop, they, they might be adding, you know, 300 RPM. And that is often way too much. If you've just settled slightly below, sometimes it's just 50 RPM is all you need to gently get back up to that, you know, final, that stabilized final approach. Or if you're in, say, a bonanza, maybe it's just an inch of manifold pressure, maybe even not quite an inch of manifold pressure. And the key there, again, is stabilized approach. If you are adding too much power and then taking it out and then adding it, you're actually creating an unstable approach by doing that. So the key is to add a little power and wait. Is it doing the job? If not, add a little more or take a little more out, you know, that kind of uh, 
very fine tuning control is going to help with a stabilized approach, which is something, you know, that's the gold standard. We all want a, a stable approach. And, and I expect that, that every approach that I complete and every approach that say I see a candidate complete, they should all be stable. Yes, I'm telling folks to be a little bit dogmatic about power settings. So, for example, on the SR20, on final, we're somewhere around 15 inches. And if they've been using 14 inches, yeah, we're probably a little bit low in the pattern or we've gotten a little bit slow. So, yeah, 15 means 15 or you know, plus or minus maybe a half an inch from there. And, of course, it will vary depending upon the amount of wind we have and the density altitude and things like that. But I would encourage everybody to try and figure out what is that magic power setting for their airplane and then set the controls fairly closely to that and then make tiny, tiny, tiny variations from there. Yeah, absolutely. So as to, you know, to summarize what we've discussed so far, you know, your pitch control is your best control to accurately hit a certain airspeed and then find Find changes. I, I like the way you're thinking about having some numbers, some ballpark numbers. So, you know, when I'm on the downwind, you know, usually I'm at about 13 and a half inches of, of manifold pressure, say. And as I'm approaching toward the airport, uh, as you say, winds make a difference. So if it might be that I need closer to, say, 14 inches of manifold pressure to you know, maintain the the desired track. So it's all about fine adjustments and quick adjustments to to make corrections so that again our our approaches are stable. Let's talk briefly about one other uh, maneuver in which people really need to be mindful of operating on the backside of the power curve, and that's slow flight. Everything we've just talked about completely applies to slow flight. If you are trying to get a little bit slower, pitch up a little bit. If you want to be a little bit faster, pitch down a little bit. If you're a little bit low, add a little bit of power. Could it be any simpler? I mean, it really is exactly the same thing in slow flight as it is for for, uh, landing. Absolutely. And that's where flight instructors say, if you are going for your next flight review, go high, you know, get a several thousand feet of altitude and and witness uh, the proper way to control your altitude and airspeed during slow flight, and then you can maybe practice when you, what happens when you don't do that the correct way. So again, in a safe environment with an instructor with a lot of altitude, go ahead and see how hard that is and how suboptimal it is so that, you know, one of the reasons, of course, that we practice slow flight is we want to make sure that when we get to the pattern, when we are close to the ground, we're on our A game. So see what happens maybe when you're on your B game way up high with an instructor and you'll see it's it's not easy to do. And here's my little tip for really making slow flight incredibly simple. If you've got your left hand on the stick or the yoke, use your left hand to control the left instrument, which is the airspeed. If you've got your right hand on the throttle, use your right hand to control the right instrument, which is the altimeter. Really couldn't be any simpler than that. You know, I've never heard that before, but I might steal that from you if that's okay. (laughs) It's a maxism. (laughs) Catherine, thanks so much for joining us here today. Where do people go to find out more about you and your work? You bet. I write Flying Smart for AOPA Pilot Magazine. I run Ace Aerobatic School, aceaerobaticschool.com in Suwannee, Tennessee. And uh, yeah, I also direct the uh, Flying Tigers, which is a flight school that I have helped my university, Sewanee, uh, to start. So I I have lots of jobs, but fortunately, I love them all. (laughs) You're great. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Take care. My thanks to Catherine Cavagnaro for joining us today. You'll find links to her flight school and her YouTube channel in our show notes. Coming up next, your feedback and questions, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And let's start with good news. First, congratulations to Jeremy Webb, who's a client of mine. He just passed his commercial in a Cirrus SR20. Great job, Jeremy. I know he plans to work on his CFI in the future. Very cool. And mega supporter Josiah Freeman reports he's passed his instrument rating. Congratulations to you. 
And we've got a new mega supporter we'll talk about in a moment, Don Jones. He's passed his instrument rating. Again, congratulations to you, Don. And finally, a patron supporter, Deb Gangwish, has passed her instrument rating. So congratulations to everyone on their new ratings. And this will be the third week in a row that I am headed down to SoCal to do some training for somebody in a vision jet. Last weekend, as we were flying in the vicinity of St. George, Utah, I heard a rather interesting conversation on guard frequency. This was on March 7th, around 1240 p.m. If you want to see if you can find it on live ATC. What we heard was ATC calling on guard saying, VFR aircraft 15 miles north of the 29 Palms Airport, you are in a restricted area. Contact ATC on frequency something.125. I didn't write down the beginning of it. And this was repeated many, many times. And of course, what I was thinking was if the pilot had such poor skills that he was flying around in a restricted area, he probably was unaware of the requirement for all planes to monitor 121.5 while in flight. So I'm sure he did not hear ATC call him, which is why they called so many times. So just a reminder, if you're not in the habit of listening to the guard frequency, remember to monitor 121.5 when you fly. That can be a little problematic. We missed an ATC call last weekend in the vision jet because we were hearing something come through on 121.5 and it covered up what ATC was trying to say to us on the frequency that we were on. So yeah, it's a little bit challenging, but we're supposed to do it. And to get back home from teaching last weekend, the owner of the vision jet said, Hey, why don't you just take the jet home to uh, San Jose? And then that way you'll have it when you come down to teach me this weekend. So I had a fun hour flight on my own. I recorded that using my iPhone and I posted that as a video for Patreon supporters at the $20 and up level. So they saw that last week and basically it's about 10 minutes showing different phases of the flight coming up uh, from uh, Lancaster, California to San Jose. So that was fun. Also on that particular trip, we flew into Jackson, Wyoming, which is just a beautiful location. I've been there a few times and I have already edited that video and that will be posted for Patreon supporters at the end of this week. So look for that if you're supporting us at the Patreon level of $20 a month and up. And my thanks to AOPA. They mentioned me in an article that uh, was just published. It's called CFI for life. Why you should teach. Uh, I really want to thank them for, for mentioning me. That was a great article. In it, by the way, I think they mentioned uh, some of my books, which I do on the side. And coincidentally, just a couple of days ago, I got an email from PayPal supporter Fred Canavan. Fred sent a picture of himself, and he's holding my Max Truscott's G3000 and G5000 glass cockpit handbook, which he said he's using to brush up on because he is going to be doing some mentoring for a pilot in a Piper M600. So that sounds like great fun. Of course, that has the same G3000 that's in the Vision Jet. So Fred, have fun with that. And I saw an email come through from one of the flight instructors at the West Valley Flying Club. And it was kind of interesting. He said, FYI, I just got off the phone with the AOPA and they concur that under the FAA's special security instructions, Russian citizens are prohibited from any form of flight operation in U.S. airspace, regardless of if they are also U.S. citizens. Well, fortunately, there's been clarification on that. That turns out not to be the case. The latest notum, and I'll go ahead and read this, basically restricts aircraft, not Russian citizens, though there are a couple of exceptions. And so that notum reads in part, all aircraft registered in the Russian Federation, all Russian state aircraft, regardless of the state of registry of the aircraft, and all aircraft owned, chartered, leased, operated, or controlled by, for or for the benefit of a person who is a citizen of the Russian Federation, are prohibited from operating to, from, within, or through U.S. territorial airspace. And there's some exceptions for humanitarian and search and rescue and so on. But there's also apparently a, a clause that's been added that says there's a very, very short list of some specific citizens who are not allowed to be flying in the U.S. So that's the latest on that. And here's an email from new Patreon supporter Eric Berg. He writes, I enjoyed episode 223 about lasers. I shared a house during medical school with fellow medical student and widely acknowledged father of the personal computer, Ed Roberts, developer of the Altair 8800 microcomputer. Ed was the only person ever to write a paycheck to his employees, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, before they formed Microsoft together for a computer code that Ed paid them to write, which eventually became Microsoft Basic. Ed was previously a United States Air Force engineer working at the Kirkland Air Force Base or Sandia Labs, which would be in New Mexico. 
The project he worked on was a laser weapon designed to blind the enemy. The Air Force had a working model during the Vietnam War, but it was never used. He says you can read about Ed here, and I'll include that link in the show notes. He also said you can also read about laser weapon history here. And again, I'll include that link in the show notes. And here's an email from Chris in Virginia. He says, Max, near the end of episode 223, the question came up about the value of VGs. That would be Vortex Generators. I was a chief check pilot for the Civil Air Patrol when we had VGs installed on our MAL MXT-7. The difference at low speed installs was amazing. It flew like a different and much better airplane. Previously, stalls were quite exciting. There would be the tiniest and shortest buffet just before you were looking 30 degrees down, and unless you had the ball perfectly centered, a huge wing drop. Afterwards, it stalled like a Cherokee. Very gentle, fully controllable throughout VG's work, at least in the mall. Thanks for that, Chris. And here's an email from John in Georgia. He says, first, I want to thank you for doing your podcast, which I enjoy. I just listened to episode 223 and wanted to share a thought based on your conversation with Rob Mark about green lasers. I wanted to share a perspective regarding a potential benefit of such lasers. For years, long before I became a private pilot on January 15th of this year, I've touted the need for pilots to keep a green laser in their flight bag. In short, I believe this laser could be used to save their life in an emergency. There is no doubt that having a laser pointed at you can be dangerous, but my thought is that I would use it to signal a search and rescue plane or helicopter if I had gone down, especially in the water. I believe that a few short pulses from my laser would help a rescue pilot find me quickly. To me, this use case seems rather obvious, but I'm open to rebuttals. Thanks for hearing me out. And again, thanks for everything you do for the aviation community. Well, John, I think that you probably don't want to point it directly at the aircraft because you don't want to risk blinding your rescuer. But I think that if there's any moisture in the air at all, which there usually is, if you were to circle it around above you, it would probably be quite visible uh, from some distance. So interesting idea you have there. And here's an email from Connor in California. He says, a longtime listener of the Aviation News Talk podcast. I'm a CFI and fly a Cessna 182RG out of Concord, California. I work as a nurse in critical care at a local hospital, and I'm currently applying to medical school. My pre-med requirements require me to take general physics classes. When covering sections pertaining to electricity, I was curious about how factors of voltage, current, and resistance would be considered in GA electric aircraft. One interesting consideration in electric aircraft will be the use of high voltage systems and the increased risk of electrical arcing at high altitudes. Transmitting large quantities of electrical power around an aircraft will ideally be done at high voltages in order to minimize resistive losses. However, high voltages increase the risk of insulation breakdown and arcing. Unlike electric powered motor vehicles, airplanes operate at higher altitudes. Furthermore, according to Passion's Law, the dielectric properties of air change with altitude. As altitude increases, less voltage is required to reach the electrical breakdown voltage of air, increasing the risk of arcing, insulator damage, and fire. Of course, this factor, along with numerous others related to electric power in airplanes, will be taken into consideration by engineers. I do wonder, though, what type of training and inspections will be necessary to keep electric GA pilots safe. Perhaps one day our pre-flight checklist will include inspecting electrical lines for signs of damage. Connor, thanks so much for sending that. A lot of interesting thoughts you have there. And yes, I agree. There are probably going to be some electrical engineers hired to work on these projects, and they're going to definitely take into consideration a lot of things that you mentioned here. As for the pre-flight, I would imagine that most of what we do from a pre-flight is going to be external to the wires, which are going to be largely inside the aircraft. But I suppose if people pulled off a cowling, they could take a look at wires going to the, uh, to the motor, make sure that they're nice and tight. And here's an email from Patreon supporter Jonathan Marty. He says, I'll be going off to training for a regional airline in a few weeks. I was wondering if you would do a podcast or maybe mention some training recommendations on the transition into jets. For example, my understanding is that it can be difficult to transition to jets because of how much faster things happen, descent planning, glass cockpits, etc. I think this could be a very helpful topic, especially since so many people are making the jump into regionals from GA. I also believe since you often help new vision jet pilots transition, you'd have some tips as an instructor. I've been listening for a few years and haven't seen any previous podcast about this topic. So if you've already done one, please share the podcast number. Great question, Jonathan. No, I don't think I've covered this topic before. And I'm sorry, I can't create a whole new episode for you on short notice. But here are a couple of suggestions that might help. A couple of books I recommend. First would be Greg Brown's 
the Turbine Pilot's Flight Manual. I used that when I transitioned into my first turbine aircraft, and boy, that was incredibly helpful, especially from a systems standpoint. One of the big things you're going to find when you jump into jets is that you've got a lot more systems that you need to be familiar with, and Greg Brown's book does a nice job of outlining how those different systems work in general. Of course, you'll learn the specifics for your particular aircraft. Another book you might want to consider is Jason Blair's An Aviator's Field Guide to Middle Altitude Flying. And then finally, I would say you want to be extremely proficient in instruments. Not only should you be able to pass a instrument proficiency check very well, but you're also going to need to be good at some things that don't typically come up in a typical IPC. And those would be departure procedures and especially arrivals. I would read up on arrivals and study some charts, especially at some of the big airports like Memphis or JFK, where a lot of the simulator work is done for airlines. And of course, you mentioned a couple other things, which are definitely a big deal. Things do happen faster. And so I would not be just chit-chatting in cruise. I would say as soon as you get up in cruise, start planning your arrival. You know, start working on getting the ADA, start working on frequencies, start figuring out which approaches you're going to be flying, start briefing those approaches. Things happen so fast that if you wait until you get close to your destination, you're going to be behind the game. So use that time in cruise to plan Of course, you want to know about descent planning. You want to know some of the rules of thumb that you use for figuring out when you need to descend based upon your altitude and your airspeeds. And of course, you want to be good on glass cockpits. And if glass cockpits are new to you, then I'd strongly recommend you get my book, which is Max Truscott's G1000 and Perspective Glass Cockpit Handbook, as thousands of people have used that to transition into glass cockpits. And have fun in your training. I think you're really going to enjoy the transition. And congratulations on getting hired. And we've got some other congratulations to some people who have made a big step to support the show. Thank you so very much to two new mega supporters. First, Kevin Hendrickson, who's a local gentleman here that I think I'll be flying with soon, has signed up at the mentee level, one of our highest levels. Thanks so much for that, Kevin. We'll be talking quite a bit in the future. And also Don Jones, who's signed up at the $50 a month level. And we'll tell you more about both of those people in a future show. We've also had a couple of people who've signed up at the $20 a month level, so they'll be looking at the Vision Jet videos, the one I posted last week and the one I'll be posting at the end of this week. My thanks to Eric Berg and to Maurice Culver. And we've also had some one-time donations. Uh, James Allen donated $100 via PayPal. He says he flies two Navajos, a Baron, and a PA-32. I'm an experienced pilot and continue to benefit from your podcast. I appreciate your work. Well, thank you, James, and thanks so much for your support. And I want to thank Preston Root for donating once again this year. He donated $250 by check. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. I hope your flying is going well back there in the Southeast. This show probably takes me close to 20 hours a week to produce each week. And I certainly love getting a little bit of support for that because certainly when I'm spending time recording, I can't be out there making a living doing what I do, which is teaching out the traffic pattern. It's easy to support the show. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. You can then select the amount you'd like to donate each month using your credit card. Or you can also donate via PayPal at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And you can make either a one-time donation or a regular monthly donation via PayPal. And of course, I'll read your name on the show. And I want to thank everyone for your contributions, regardless of how you support the show, whether it's through your emails, whether it's through the reviews that you've left on podcast players, such as the Apple Podcast app. I'll read a couple of those in the future. Thank you so very much for your support. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.